Okay, let's start. A very good evening to one and all. I uh, want greetings to all who have joined from India and across the globe. And we would like to welcome you all uh, in the sweet name of our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have come to the end of this week and uh, in fact, uh, almost the end of this year as well. And uh, looking back, no doubt things were tough, but uh, we need to thank our God who is so good and gracious towards us. And more importantly, he has opened up this online avenue and this platform of TRC to study God's word. Today we have the session with a subject uh, dealing with inductive Bible study and hermeneutics taken by our beloved brother, Benjamin Vogis from Pune. Uh, we would like to welcome you, brother, to this meeting. We all know that uh, there are challenging portions in the scriptures, but uh, as we're looking in the previous sections using the three inductive Bible study steps and the three different principles of hermeneutics, we are seeing how can we study, understand and interpret the scriptures in a better and confident way so as to deal with such challenging portions. And in fact, in the last session, uh, we had the three questions. And we're seeing the beautiful representation of different worlds involved in biblical hermeneutics and how to deal with it uh, using an interpretive process, uh, the study method, which helps us to bridge the different worldview gaps. So for this session, I request to everyone to sit very prayerfully as there are learnings, which is indeed a serious exercise that we need to learn since uh, we are all accountable to God for our interpretation and uh, exposition. So I, before I hand over to Brother Benjamin Vogis, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious and a loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and this opportunity that you've given to us this last Saturday of this year that you've given to us to come into your presence and to study thy scriptures, O Lord. We are thankful for thy loving kindness and the tender mercies that you have showered upon us, O oh Lord. We are thankful and grateful for revealing who you are and what you have done to us, O oh Lord, through thy scriptures that was revealed us. We are thankful and we praise you, O oh Lord. Lord, in this evening time, O oh Lord, thank you for enabling the servant, Brother Benjamin Vogis, to come into our presence. Lord, to tease the subject, O oh Lord, we thank you for enabling our brother to you to teach us, O Lord, in the past days. And once again, in this evening time, we commit the brother into mighty hands, O Lord. We pray that you may help him and guide him and shower all the necessary grace, O Lord. And Lord, we pray that we who are hearers, O Lord, we may be able to brightly observe, understand, and interpret the scriptures. And not just that, O Lord, we may really apply that in our practical lives, O Lord. Lord, we need your grace and uh, Lord, we pray that you may help us so that we may have the desire, the commitment and the discipline to study the scriptures, O Lord, so that we may be the God approved workers in rightly dividing the words of truth. Lord, thank you for enabling thy brothers and sisters to join from different parts of the globe and to join this online platform. We are thankful and Lord, we pray that you may take the control of this entire meeting from the beginning till the end of Lord. Thank you for answering our prayer. We ask all these things in the most precious name for Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Over to you, brother. Thank you, brother Abby. <clears throat> It's a joy and pleasure again to be with you with the subject of inductive Bible study and hermeneutics. We are studying how we can better study and interpret the Bible. The announcement for this session said, as I can read from this handbook as well, the suggestion that 
we should develop strong convictions on the why of inductive bible study and hermeneutics now you will find me repeating this a few times i will mention why we have reached the end of the year calendar year now if we look back upon our life last year it will be a very good question to ask how much of discipline and commitment we each one of us had to systematically study the bible now unless we have a strong convictions about the value of methodical bible study and the necessary necessity to attach a high priority to it and instill in our lives the discipline necessary to accomplish this we will not progress much and the method methodology of inductive bible study and hermeneutics will remain in the textbooks and it will not be part of our lives to a great extent this handbook i have shared with you we are in lesson 1 and the section i am referring to is developing strong convictions on the why today i'll be referring to something called a meta narrative in an attempt to convince all of us better that have understanding the principles of hermeneutics is going to greatly help us hear the bible hear god speak to us in a better and more clear way and i'll also be highlighting how reading and studying the bible is different from reading a children's comic book which at least many of us would have done when we were all children i would like to draw your attention without reading the actual words to acts 17 10 to 11 where it speaks about the the disciples in berea who were mentioned to be more nobler or fair minded than those in thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness but also searched the scriptures daily so the bereans had this very good discipline and habit of searching the scriptures daily this is exactly why i suggested that having this discipline maybe for some time maybe half an hour maybe an hour every day is a very noble thing to aim for in 2021 and that is why the conviction that bible study and the method of better bible study is really valuable is necessary so that we will instill that kind of a discipline in our lives when we look at the life of timothy paul speaks about timothy in this way in second timothy chapter 3 verses 12 to 17 he entreats timothy to continue in the things which he have learned and he mentions that timothy has been assured of those things and from childhood he has known the holy scriptures and paul mentions that he timothy must continue knowing that knowing from whom he has learned those things which might refer to his grandmother and his mother as well as paul now this conviction of a regular discipline of bible study it has resulted for timothy in 
being a deputy of paul and in chapter 2 verse 2 which is a theme verse of trc paul having the confidence to entrust timothy of training other faithful men and this verse alludes to the fact that this probably started in his own family so this is the importance of this conviction the conviction has to start in us the discipline has to be in our lives individually the discipline has to be in the lives of our families as families then as role models we can extend that to the assemblies and maybe the wider world so i would strongly encourage you if you are in the habit of setting goals for the new year to strongly consider having a regular discipline of bible study as one of your top goals i'm going to refer i mentioned an example today that we should not read the bible like how or it is reading the bible is a little different from how we read a children's comic book and i am explaining to you why it is so sadly we often read the bible like a children's comic book i am referring to this book very important book useful book how to read the bible for all its worth by stuart douglas and god and fee which is often a very standard textbook used in inductive bible study and hermeneutics this book refers to three levels of narrative and the highest level is what i called the meta narrative the meta narrative is the end to end story contained in the bible as to what god is trying to do from eternity past to eternity future it is often described as as a story that explains all other stories one way of looking at or or describing this meta narrative of scripture is the story of redemption or the redemptive history now this is the grand story of the bible the sad thing is that at least in my life it is not so often that i hear or maybe many of us hear about this meta narrative of scripture explained or expounded in the way it should be and many a times this is not adequately understood we also have a, a second level of the narrative of scripture for example it refers to what is the narrative of the old testament or what is the narrative of the new testament again as i said we often do not hear this story of the bible this narrative the grand narrative of the testaments being explained or expounded and much less understood then there is a third level which is the individual stories that we find in the different books now this is how we often read the bible we read the individual stories and instead of connecting these individual stories with the first level and the second level we read these stories in isolation and often teach them as stories that teach morals when we study in school when we study english literature the textbooks contains a lot of stories and often those stories ends with a moral if you are studying the story of the hare and tortoise 
the moral of the story that I have studied is slow and steady wins the race. This is how we often teach the stories of the Bible. I'm suggesting that that is not how it should be done. And if you read these textbooks, and hopefully sometime later in this series, God willing, we'll go to in detail of how we should study a narrative. When we read these individual stories, we should connect with the higher levels and the grand purpose of God so that the stories can be understood in context. Now, a major portion of the Bible are stories, are narratives. It is important to understand why God used narratives to convey truth. We know that God's word is truth. God's word contains truth. In a more technical way, we say that God's word contains propositional truth. The truths in, in the Bible, including the stories, can be reduced to truth statements, propositional truth statements, which can be written as affirmations and denials. Now, why did God use stories to convey the truth instead of just telling what we should do or we should not do or what we should believe and we should not believe? One important reason is that the Bible was written in a culture which was by and large oral. We live, live in a culture where writing and printing is very much common. And we live in a digital Having a writing was a rare thing and it was a costly thing. For when God com communicated revelation about himself, truths about himself, he used stories. And we all know that stories are very easy to remember. The stories we hear in our bedtime from our parents, the stories we hear from the Bible through our parents, the stories we study in Sunday school, whether it be of Adam and Eve or Abraham and Isaac, even as children, they are very easy to remember. So the oral culture is a very important reason why God uses stories to convey truth. And the thing I have been highlighting a while ago is that we often miss to learn and teach the grand story of the Bible and the grand story in the individual testaments. And we take the individual stories in isolation and read them as moral stories, which is not the correct way to read them. So I'm trying to convince to you the importance of understanding biblical hermeneutics so that we are able to read the Bible in a proper way and actually understand what God wants us to understand from the Bible. Live, live those truths or live those stories and also convey those stories to others. I mentioned that the oral culture is a very important reason why God used stories. The same is the reason why God used poetry because poetry is with rhymes and repetition are very easy to remember. So the writers of the Bible took great pains to write poetry that is rhyming and very and are very easy to remember. Another important reason why God used stories to convey the truth is that instead of just telling the truths, when those truths are conveyed through the stories of real people who lived on this earth, with the very same challenges that we, we often face in our lives, 
we can relate these truths to actual human experience and can be convinced that these truths are practical and can be applied and lived in real life. I want to mention that, I mentioned that the Bible contains or has an end-to-end -end story. Now, there is a way to read that story. And one of the ways to read that story is based on how the Bible is organized. I would just like to show you how the Hebrew Bible is organized, which is according to the Masoretic text, which is also called the Tanakh. When you are studying Bibliology, Dr. Johnson C. Philip is going through all this. Now the Hebrew Bible, according to the Masoretic text, has a threefold division. In other manuscript families, there are other ways in which the canon is divided and there, the number of books also differ. The, the books that we have in the Masoretic text are the very same books we have in our English Bible, but it's in a different order. The Masoretic text is divided into the law, the prophets, and the writings, or Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim. And it ends with Chronicles. Again, I'm trying to peculiar your interest. Time doesn't allow us to go through this in detail today. Hopefully, again, God willing, in the future, we'll cover this in future. So what, what is the story? Why, is, why are these books of the law organized as the law? Why are the books of the prophets organized as the prophets? And why are they following the law? And what is what are the writings doing? Understanding all this helps us understand the story of the Old Testament in a better perspective. I'll give also some examples later in this session. In one line, we have God giving the law. Then when Israel moves away from the law, the prophets try to tries to enforce the law and the writings, it enjoys the law. I mentioned the story of the Old Testament and the Old Testament, we should attach priority to the organization of the canon and how the canon was organized by the people at those time periods. Now the English Bible ends with Malachi for the Old Testament, but as I said, it ends with Chronicles in the Masoretic text. Now this is the important aspect about God's story. God's story of redemption, if that's the way you want to look at that story, or the kingdom of God. It's there in the Old Testament. It's there in the New Testament. The canon is complete, but as explained also in the book of Revelation, the story continues. Why this is important is because we often think that God's redemptive program finishes or stops with the completion of the canon. God's redemptive program and God's kingdom program continues until the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth when everything will be finally restored. It, is con it, it was continuing in 2020. Now the important thing is at this time of this year when we look at the year that is going by, 
Do we really think of last year as an year where God's program was out working in our life, in the life of our family, in the life of our assemblies and the life of the world? And because God's program, if the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ tarries and the world does not end, it will also continue next year. Now, therefore, when we live out these truths as contained in the scriptures, we are actually participating in God's grand redemptive plan. We are living out God's story. The Bible tells how Abraham lived that story, how Isaac lived that story, or Paul lived that story, or Timothy lived that story. God Consider it imp important, their story is important to include them as part of the scripture. When we read Hebrews 11, we find that God also mentioned a lot of un unmentioned pe people who were not mentioned otherwise. Those who lived in caves, those who wore goat skins, God considered them as heroes. Faith, you know, we call them the heroes of faith. Now, my best understanding of scripture is that while we will not be part of the story in the canon, nevertheless, the stories, the lives that we live as part of God's redemptive story that has not ended is as important to God as the, character, the story of the characters we find in the Bible. This is the narrative, you know. The, now, I, we have not even gone into what that story is. But this is the narrative that we should hold on as we live out our lives every year. This is the narrative that we should instill in our next generation to live out so that they, get, they see the big picture they see God's grand plan, they see God's grand purpose, and they feel enthused and excited to live out that story. This is from the Old Testament introduction by Raymond Dillard and Tremper Longman. This is how a typical structure of a story unfolds or a narrative unfolds in the Bible. A story has a scene, it has plot, it has characters, it has characterization, it has a setting, the action begins, conflict is generated, the conflict becomes intense, then there is climax, the conflict begins to unravel and the conflict is resolved and the action ends. And Dillard and Longman explains this as to how this shows this diagram as a guide for us on how we should read the biblical narratives. When we are living out God's story, the same things happens to our lives as well. Our lives have conflicts. At times, our conflicts become very intense. Then God intervenes to unravel the conflict. And finally, the conflict is resolved. Now, the, I said the Bible has a narrative, meta-narrative, and we should live out that meta-narrative that continues God's story, that redemptive story that continues until the eternity future. Now, the world has alternative narratives that captivates the mind of the people. The meta-narrative is also called 
I'm reading from the Handbook of Bible Interpretation by Randolph Tate. Another word for meta narrative is thought systems. You might have heard of postmodernism, which denies absolute truth. What postmodernism does is it denies the validity of meta narratives. It says that everybody should have their own small stories, their own way of looking at reality to live out. And here is another example as to why ideas or stories or thought systems are very important. Because those ideas are used by leaders to control the minds and lives of people, of societies and whole nations. And this is a very important book. Thankfully, it was first introduced to me by our faculty, Dr. Johnson C. Philip, again, 20 years ago. The book is called Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave. And the book is by Dave Brees. Look at some of the examples. Charles Darwin, who propounded the theory of evolution. And look at the influence that idea had and still has across the world, even though Charles Darwin has gone into the grave. Or look at Karl Marx. The idea of communism that He proposed, as we know, control several societies and several nations. There is Julius Wellhausen. In one of the earlier sessions, we mentioned about historical criticism, how that challenged the traditional understanding of how we would read the Pentateuch. There are other examples. I'm not going into them, but just wanted to highlight these examples as to how ideas that are propounded by people, ways of looking at reality, the ways of looking at the universe, the world that are propounded by people, really embeds into the mind of generations and control the way they live. So to move our generation towards God, it is very important for us to read the Bible in a way that it should be read and instill and communicate that, those meta narratives into the, into the minds of our next generation. Personally, I believe that the reason, and the, one of the most important reasons why the next generation is not enthused. Many of them are very cold about spiritual things is because they do not hear these, the, the big picture of the Bible, God's plan for the universe, God's plan for them, expounded them with the level of clarity that is in the Bible. Think of this, dear ones, that when the Bible was written, when the Bible was read thousands of years ago, there was a certain way in which they looked at individual portions of the Bible and individual stories of the Bible. Now we have detached ourselves from that reality and we are looking at individual stories, individual portions of the Bible in isolation. Without being able to connect as much as we should into that big picture. So that is what I'm suggesting we should rectify when we st read, study, and expound the Bible. Here are some of the questions that a meta-narrative tries to address. This is a very important book, Living God's Word, Discovering Our Place in the Great Story of Scripture by Scott Duval and Daniel Hayes. 
they propose these questions where are we what kind of world do we live in who are we what does it mean to be a human being what's wrong what is essential what is the essential problem with us and the world what's the solution what can fix the problem where are we in the story where do we belong and how does story affect our lives right now one of the assignments i gave is the book of genesis genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and one of the suggestions i have is that when god you know god's story unfolds in the scripture from genesis and continues till revelation and when god communicates genesis through moses he's starting to tell that story and he's trying to answer some of these questions in a way that is true and in the in a way that god wants us to know now look at naturalism which is again adopted by the theory of revolution the philosophy adopted by the theory of evolution this is from the baker encyclopedia of christian apologetics by norman giesler who is himself an apologist naturalism refers to the view that nature is the whole show and it denies the supernatural there's a wonderful book it's called uh, genesis the genesis factor by john dennis and david helm what they try to do is they try to address how the book of genesis addresses tries to address the world view questions now story the concept of story is a very important but highly debated concept in theology i know that in this discussion we have those who are beginners but also those who are a little advanced so i am trusting in god to give the different types of audience something to take away so i am referring to a book called introduction to biblical hermeneutics by walter kaiser and uh, moises silva they refer to one of the important developments in christian theology by two important people called hans free and paul ricord who has written extensively about biblical narratives however their view of the story in the bible is a little different from the conservative evangelical view they stop short of making any claims about the truthfulness of the stories narrated in the bible according to them it is enough that the stories communicate some meaning the story as the concept of a story as propounded by hans free and paul ricord they argue that in free's words the world of the text is fictional or it is it is not necessarily history but just history like i am mentioning this so that as you study the bible and as you study narratives and as you study even genesis you get a better understanding of the different views the scholars take about genesis there is naturalism there is the post liberal view of what a story is etc you might have heard about dispensa- dispensationalism i spoke about the meta narrative 
I spoke about the next level of story, the Old Testament, the story of the Old Testament, the sto story of the New Testament. We refer to dispensationalism in some of the earlier sessions. Now, dispensationalism views dispensations as the organizing principle of biblical theology or the story of the Bible. I just mentioned this so that you will be able to connect dispensationalism to the overall story or theology of the scripture. I'm going to quickly show you two, three examples as to how people summarize this story. This is from the book which I have showed earlier, Living God's Word, Discovering Our Place in the Great Story of Scripture. Daniel Hayes and Scott Duval summarizes the great story of the Bible like this. In Genesis 1 to 11, we have creation and crisis. Genesis 12 to 50, we have the covenant, which we know is the Abrahamic covenant. Exodus 1 to 15, we have the calling out of a nation. Exodus 16 to 40, and in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we have the giving of the law, which these others call as commandments. Joshua and Judges write the story of the conquest and canonization. Ruth, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles deals with the kingdom, the rise and the decline of the kingdom. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs deal with communion and common sense. Kings, 1 Kings 12 to 2 Kings 25, 2 Chronicles chapter 10 to verse 36, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah deal with the crumbling of the kingdom. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi deal with, deals with captivity and coming home. And I mentioned earlier that one of the ways in which we can do biblical theology or Old Testament theology or New Testament theology is using the theme Kingdom of God. And you'll find that this book also in this story alludes to the Kingdom. Then we have interlude between the Testaments. Then we have the coming of the Messiah Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we have the church in Acts and the epistles. And we have consummation in the book of Revelation. I want to give you another example. This is from the Old Testament in seven sentences, Christopher Wright. Before I read this, I want to mention one thing about any of the resources that I am showing. About any aspect that we are studying here, there'll be a number of different viewpoints. So when we look at some of the aspects from any book, one of the skills that we should develop is the ability to discern what to adopt and what not to adopt. So just referring to a book or an author does not necessarily mean that I personally or we collectively have to agree to everything that we, is written in any of those books. Now in this book, it summarizes the Old Testament in seven sentences. The first sentence, the first heading is creation. And the verse is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second heading is Abraham, Genesis 12.3. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. The third heading is Exodus. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, Exodus 22. Then we have David, we have Abraham with the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Sinaiti covenant made with Israel. Then we have David with whom God made the Davidic covenant. And under the title David, this book refers to 1 Samuel 13, 14. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. The fifth heading is prophets. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, 8. Which we often refer to the, as the essence of the law. The law is not just rules. At its core, we read and understand the character of God and the ethics that he wants to instill in all of us. Then we have the gospel. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. Isaiah 52, 7. Then we have Psalms and wisdom. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalms 23, 1. Similarly, we have the New Testament in seven sentences. Written by Gary M. Birch. So, in the Old Testament, we have promise. In the New Testament, we have number one, fulfillment. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. We have kingdom. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, 15. We have the cross. The son of man must be killed and on the third day be raised alive. Luke 9, 22. Grace. By grace, you have been saved through faith, not by works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Covenant. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 1 Peter 2, 9. I want to mention that according to the dispensationalist view or one of the dispensationalist view, there is no covenant God has made with the church. The theological covenants, including the new covenant, are with Israel and the church experiences the blessings of the new covenant. Then we have the spirit. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Romans 8, 9. Completion. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 20, 21, 1. And here is another way of looking at the story. In the drama of scripture, Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story by Michael Goheen and Craig Bartholomew. Act 1, so they adopt N.T. Wright's six-act structure. Act 1, God establishes his kingdom in creation. That's a wonderful way to look at the Genesis story. God establishes his kingdom on the earth or in a physical universe. God was eternally king or is eternally king. Act 2, rebellion in the kingdom, which is the fall, which is again in Genesis. Act 3, the king chooses Israel. Redemption is in initiated. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then in Exodus, scene 1, people for the king. Scene 2, a land for the people, which is Canaan. Act 4, the coming of the king, redemption accomplished, which is Jesus Christ. Act 5, spreading the news of the king, the mission of the church. Scene 1, from Jerusalem to Rome. Scene 2, and into all the world. And Act 6, the return of the king, redemption completed. Hope you have found the need to look at the meta-narrative and uh, at the next level, the narratives of the individual testaments and the need to connect individual stories to the larger stories in the Bible, uh, a useful suggestion. And the suggestion that God's redemptive story doesn't end with the canon. And we are also expected to inhabit that story 
and live out those stories in our lives. And our lives, whether it be in 2020 or 2021 or beyond, if the Lord allows, are important in God's sight. You found it valuable. And as we read the scripture and expound the scripture, connect to the grand purpose. So that the next generation is enthused by it and they really want to live those story, live God's story. And uh, they are guided in their lives by the meta-narrative of scripture and not the postmodern view or the other thought systems in the world that we refer to. We live in an era where there is a great battle for the mind. Uh, it is important for we as individuals, we as families, and we as assemblies to win that battle, to lead that battle with the right proposition. Otherwise, our next generation will be lost to alternate ideas. Thank you once again. After I close, I, I'm closing now, but I'll be sharing in the chat window some assignments to take away as well as my contact details. Um, please, um, the assignment has the three principles of hermeneutics, but some topics to explore in the study of Genesis using the three principles of hermeneutics. As I said, we have to develop, we need to have an idea of what is a right thing to adopt and what is that we should not adopt. So when I'm saying, please read this, it doesn't mean that whatever I'm asking you to read is the absolutely best way to look at it. Please keep that in mind. Thank you. May God's name be glorified for giving us this opportunity in 2020 to study some of the subjects which are typically taught in seminary, outside of seminary, to a wider audience, which was my lifelong vision. I'm so grateful to God for making this possible and to TERC and may God's name be glorified.